Well, Mike has given me a number of uh, passages to uh, refer to this morning, so I'm going to ask you to, to uh, bear with me. We're going to go through four of them, beginning with our passage that we will be spending time in this morning in 1 Samuel. It's going to be 1 Samuel 19, and we're going to look at um, verses 8 through 17. Again, that's 1 Samuel 19, verses 8 through 17. When there was war again, David went out and fought with the Philistines and defeated them with great slaughter, so that they fled before him. Now there was an evil spirit from the Lord on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing the harp with his hand. And Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, so that he stuck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Then Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him in order to put him to death in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow, you will be put to death. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went out and fled and escaped. And Michael took the household idol and laid it on the bed and put a quilt of goat's hair at its head and covered it with clothes. When Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. Then Saul sent messengers to see David, saying, bring him up to me on his bed that I may put him to death. When the messengers entered, behold, the household idol was on the bed with the quilt of goat's hair at his head. So Saul said to Michael, why have you deceived me like this and let my enemy go so that he has escaped? And Michael said to Saul, he said to me, let me go. Why should I put you to death? Okay, now we're going to next look at Psalm 18, verses 8, excuse me, verses 37 through 41. This is Psalm 18, verses 37 through 41. <clears throat> Beginning with verse 37 of Psalm 18, I pursued my enemies and overtook them and I did not turn back until they were consumed. I shattered them so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. For you have girded me with strength for battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You've also made my enemies turn their backs to me, and I destroyed those who hated me. They cried for help, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Now flip back over to Genesis. We're going to look at Genesis 31, verse 3. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. Finally, our last verse, back over into the New Testament, 2 Timothy. And this is going to be 2 Timothy. We're going to look at chapter 3, verse 5. <clears throat> just to set the context the first verse says but realize this that in the last days difficult times will come men will be lovers of self and a number of uh, particular traits of those, those men finally verse 5 he says they hold to a form of godliness although they have denied its power avoid such men as these Mike Well, good morning, everyone. I'm not used to the humidity here in the summer, so I'm wilting a little bit before you this morning. Uh, We are in the 16th lesson of the rise of David, a king without a kingdom. And I have given, uh, I asked Warren to go through those four uh, texts, they seem disjointed, but it's my job to tie it all together for you. So uh, hopefully by the Lord's power, you'll see the end result or the purpose for those desperate texts. Again, there was war, verse 8 of First Samuel 19. And David marched out and fought with the Philistines. And there is your text 
reading literally, made a great defeat among them, and they fled from before him. This opening word, again, you may have in your translation, and, or when, or again, it is a transition word, meaning life moves on, that we are moving forward into the story, and it also marks for us a new uh, time zone or epic, if you will, a transition word that stands for an episode, a paragraph, a setting of a small section that we would think would be relatively insignificant, but it's not insignificant at all. It ties us to the next flare-up with Saul's anger. We had just previously in our last lesson seen his promise to David to bring him no harm. He pledged it on oath. That will quickly be broken. I want you to observe that Jonathan here does not appear anymore in this chapter which is rather noteworthy. We had just finished extolling Jonathan in verse 7. His name mentioned three times. Why was he not mentioned anymore in regards to this chapter, this section, this life of David? It's because through the historian, by the power of the Spirit, He wants to keep the focus, the spotlight on David. We'll have all kinds of personalities, characters, places, events. They move in and out of David's life. But David is the star of the show, and he gets the spotlight to teach us all about his rise. This is important for Israel, and it is important for us because we are following this man who is a shadow of our Lord Jesus Christ. The more we learn about him, the more we learn about Christ himself. Now, we have no idea of the time lapse between verses 7 and 8. But here is the divine providence that brought about the end to the peace that Jonathan had procured between Saul and David. Again, there was war. And David is doing what God has called David to do, to namely be a valiant warrior to and for the kingdom. So he has given you a gift an ability to serve him. You can serve him directly with it or indirectly with it. But he has given us all talents and abilities. Be about that service. That is what David is doing, and that is what we should be doing as professionals. Uh, Bankers, lawyers, surgeons, salesmen, executives, housewives, whatever it is the calling for you, be about it, directly or indirectly, always in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in verse 11, Paul says, make it your ambition. That word can be translated zealous. It's the idea of striving eagerly to tend to your own affairs, to work with your hands. The Apostle Paul was always concerned about the image of the church and of himself toward outsiders. This was a big portion of S. Lewis Johnson's eschatology. Always concerned about how people would look at him and how they would look at the local church. And look at us. We're scandalized. Horrible reputation. Scandal here. Scandal there. And what do outsiders say? They're hypocrites. 
They're just like us, living like us. And now they've been caught. Let me give you an illustration of what I mean by your reputation professionally. Paul goes to Thessalonica and he takes up the trade of repairing tents. That's what he did in order to survive. And let's say as he is arriving at Thessalonica, he begins to teach in the synagogue. And uh, some Jew hears him and is attracted to his message. He had never heard these things about Christ, Jesus. And so he said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to try to get to know that man better. The way I'm going to do that, I'm going to take my tent that needs repair and I'm going to bring it to him. And so he does. Paul repairs the tent. A couple of days later, a rainstorm breaks and the tent leaks. It leaks like a sieve. Now the disgruntled Jew takes his tent, puts it under his arm and marches to his friend, Bill, Bill's tents. And he says, Bill, I had this man repair my tent, but it's leaked. Would you take a look at it? Bill looks at the tent and says, who did this work? Well, it was uh, that guy, Paul, who has come into Thessalonica. He goes, well, he didn't know what he was doing. This has to be completely Redone. Now, that's a horrible testimony. That's a direct reflection upon who we are in life representing our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be excellent in everything that God has called us to do. And so here is David. He is excellent in everything that God has called him to do. Again, there was war. And David marched out and fought. He struck them with such a great blow. And they fled in every direction. Like pulling up a, a rock and seeing the bugs scatter. That's the picture. And here we have it again. The on and off with the Philistines. That started in 1 Samuel chapter 18. And they fled before him. And they are still fleeting before him. Your successes and mine are all about him. He gives us the power. He gives us the zeal. And he gives us the drive and energy to accomplish his purpose. That's why I wanted... Warren to read for you Psalm 18, beginning in verse 37. I think this is interesting, the way David describes his victories over his enemies. In Psalm 18, beginning in verse 37, he writes, I pursued my enemies and overtook them. I did not turn back till they were destroyed. I crushed them so that they could not rise. They fell beneath my feet. <clears throat> now, that sounds like David is just talking about himself. But now notice, he's just describing the history of what he saw. Look what he says now. Here is the power behind the force of David. You armed me with strength in battle, he said. You humbled my adversaries before me. You made my enemies turn their backs in flight. The destruction of my foes, they cried for help, but there was no one there to save them. To the Lord, but he did not answer. Those last words cried to the Lord, but he did not answer. The most terrifying words 
in time and space for anyone that is alive. Back in September, my wife and I were watching a, like a two-hour documentary on 9-11 when those planes flew into the World Trade Center towers. And there you saw the orange and red smoke chasing up the streets of Manhattan as those buildings came down. And people running, running away from the smoke, running away from the debris. And you could hear them. Oh God, God, no God, no. And I turned to my wife and I said, you know, that's three or four blocks of Manhattan. What is it going to be like when he returns to bring his judgment to the world? My friends, it is a very scary proposition to fall into the hands of an angry God. And we should be people most humble and most reverent as Peter said, he brings all acts into judgment and we should be living that way every day before him. God, David said, did not answer. Meaning, he butchered them and he butchered them in righteousness. Remember, they should never have been in the land in the first place. It was because of the indolence of the tribes that the Canaanites were not completely driven out, David saw to the end of that himself. So back to our text and our narrative, in verses 9 and 10, Saul's second attack on David, and the Lord's spirit for evil came to Saul while he was sitting in his house and his spear in his hand. And David was playing the harp in his hand, and Saul sought to pin David with a spear even to the wall. This is a double providence. This has already happened one time earlier. This is the third time that we are told in the narrative that an evil spirit came upon Saul the king. Let me give those to you. The first is 1 Samuel 16, verses 14 through 23. The second, 1 Samuel 18, 10, and 11. And here is the third, 1 Samuel 19, 9. A new attempt, a third attempt, a second attempt on David and the evil spirit coming up upon him for the third time. Uh, the wickedness of Saul is clear in the scriptures. No one should make any kind of an excuse for the man. He is an enemy of David and he is an enemy of God and God's program. He just swore an oath to David's safety by oath. Psalm 15, the righteous man keeps his oath, his pledge before God, even to his own hurt. But look what he's done. The only event that has happened between that pledge and this event are David's victories over the Philistines. That's the end of verse 8 right there. Saul with a spear in his hand, David with a lyre in his hand. One man's hand is for good and for ministry. Another man's hand is for death and destruction. As the evil force comes upon him, he throws the spear again. Now, to the end of verse 10, David fled and escaped that night. After this second attempt of murder, he now realizes his time 
in Saul's court has come to an end. What an abrupt and decisive providence that is. That's the way it often is in life. Saul's spear here is our word literally to strike, meaning to pin David to the wall. And look at the response and the action from David. He fled. The verb means to literally be freed. He freed himself before, meaning he escaped Saul. This man has been anointed by the prophet Samuel making him the most important man alive theologically in the world at that time. David. And yet the sovereign plan of God is that he would go through this horrible ordeal. The sovereign plan of God goes through you and goes through me as well in this space and time called life. Oh, the things that God puts us through. But it is not to destroy us. It is to make us. These things are necessary to make us the people He wants us to be. We go back to Job. Job the most righteous. The man on all the earth that God particularly points out is his personal standard of righteousness. Job chapter 23 and verse 10. He knows the way I take. And when he has tried me, think of that word try, the horrible suffering of the man Job to lose everything and even to his own health. His wife turns against him. He has no one. And when he has tried me, I'll come forth as gold. Job telling us he will be made better as a result of what God is taking him through. You will hear me repeat in the weeks to come this same refrain. Oh, the things that God takes us through to make us the people that He wants us to be. This is a necessary time in David's life. We all want winners. We all want champions. But God is not interested in David being always a winner and a champion. He is interested in the man after his own heart to be made like him. And to be made like him, he has to suffer. And he has to go through horrible ordeals. That's our life as well. God is about a good purpose in us and through us. And it's difficult. We must keep our eyes on him and what he's doing. So Saul sent messengers to the house of David to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michael, his wife, informed David, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. And Michael let David down through the window and went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and put it in the bed and placing a quilt of goat's hair on its head and covered it with a covering. So it's another escape, a bit more complex than we have been told so far. Here we're to understand after evading Saul's spear, David went home that night. And into the night, here comes the G-men of Saul to watch him and for the purpose of killing him. Saul swore, verse 6, he swore an oath. But we learn about self-centered, selfish men. 
They make decisions based upon not prior commitments, but how they feel at the very time. And that's Saul. He wants David dead. Commitments of yesterday never mean a thing. Now, in verse 1, it was Jonathan who saved David. Now here, it will be Michael, his wife. Notice three times she is mentioned in the text. And Michael, and Michael, and Michael. The children of Saul, son and daughter, kept their commitments to David, having a higher loyalty than to their own father. See that word informed? Did she know the plot and the plan? We don't know. Is it just her intuition, sensing, knowing her father, that he probably will do David in in the morning? We don't know. But in the providence of God, so into the night, he, she lets David down out of the window and he fled away and escaped. In order to make good for David's escape, she puts an idol in the bed. This word idol is image. It's used in Genesis chapter 31, where Rachel deceived her father with idols. And this word is also found uh, tr translated idolatry in 1 Samuel 15 in verse 23. Now, I was reading that, and I thought, I'd like to have that idol. Um, maybe have Michael uh, write her name at the bottom with a date, and I'd go and sell it to the antique road show. Um, this was the actual idol in, uh, that she deceived David with. Make a fortune. But... Uh, Needless to say, we don't know where the idol went. I hate the antique road show. <laughs> my wife watches it every week. That's why I hate it. I told my wife, I said, if I die and I wake up in the antique road show, I know I didn't make it. <laughs> so up comes the sun, verse 14. Saul sent messengers to capture David, putting an idol in the bed. That's simple enough to understand the deception. I, I like to think of this kind of uh, as the uh, old-time movies where you didn't have the, you didn't have sound. You just had the everybody's walking at a fast pace, you know, black and white, and so uh, you see these troops all come up to the door. They knock on the door and. Uh, Michael, she opens the door, and you see her mouth moving, and then it flashes. He's sick, so they turn around, and they march off, you know, and they're back to Saul, and they come in, and they, before Saul, and he's sitting there on his throne, and they're talking again. He's sick, and then Saul stands up, and he motions this way. Go bring him back, you know, <laughs> dead or alive, bring him back. And so here they come marching back in. Now this time they're like the FBI raid. They break open the door and they come into the bedroom and they, he pulls back the, the bedspread and there's the idol. <laughs> you know? I just think the whole thing is kind of humorous myself. Verse 17, needless to say, when she is brought back to daddy, he ain't happy. Uh, Why did you deceive me, he says. Let my enemy go. Now, look at this. Jonathan earlier had plied his father uh, regarding David with questions that Saul couldn't answer. Persuasive speech, logic, effectively stabbing her, his father to awake with his emotional state, how he's out of kilter. But look at this. 
Back in chapter 18 and verse 21, Saul thought, see, he thought that Michal would be uh, his ace in the back pocket. I'll give Michal to David and she'll be a snare to him. But look who she actually becomes a snare to. Her father. But it's not like her brother. Not like Jonathan. No, she just lies to her father. Claiming that David had threatened her with death. Now this is what I find interesting. Robert Alter is not a Christian. He's a Jewish scholar. And he's very good with the Old Testament. And he says that this phrase, why have you deceived me, is the same as Genesis chapter 31, verse 26, which was spoken by the outraged Laban to Jacob. Now, that's very important because we believe in verbal plenary inspiration, that every word of the Bible as put there in its order and in its place by God who is seeking to teach us. And every one of those words are God-breathed. So, what I did is I took a piece of paper and put a line down the middle, and I wanted to do an analysis of Laban and of... Jacob, and of Saul, etc., and do a comparison. Here's what I found. We start in verse 3, Genesis 31. The Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So this is Jacob being obedient to the divine authority, God telling him to go. And in verses 4 through 16, Jacob tells his wives of his mistreatment and that they need to leave. In verses 22 through 25, Laban pursues Jacob. In his pursuit, a major event occurs. Verse 24. God invades Laban's mind in a dream and says to him, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, good or evil. Verse 25, Laban overtakes Jacob. And in verse 26, Laban says to Jacob, why have you deceived me? There is our sentence. The exact same words. So, here are the comparisons. I found this fascinating. First, Jacob and David. Both were righteous men. Both were fleeing mistreatment from their father-in-laws. Both, the mistreatment came from the father-in-law that had been served and serve successfully. Jacob, a shepherd. David, a military commander. Both men had wives that supported their leaving. Wives that were daughters of the antagonist. Isn't that interesting? Now here's a comparison between Laban and Saul. Both had death in mind. The text says, with Saul, it is implied. But with Laban, he says in verse 29, I have the power to harm you. Meaning he wanted to kill Jacob. No doubt about it. Both actions were the enemies of God and God's program. The death of Jacob, the death of David. Both used the term deception against themselves. And both 
made pledges and commitments in front of witnesses. Isn't that amazing? Now, the liberal would tell us, well, it's not amazing at all. Because you see, you have just one story and then you have two separate individuals writing off the same story. And therefore, there's nothing inspired about this. It's just one common story. But we don't believe that at all. We believe in verbal plenary inspiration. That this, in fact, were two separate events marked by centuries of time. And they were two separate and distinct personalities. So why did God put it in such a way that we could make that comparison? I think the answer is God is showing us these are the people that are around us all the time. Selfish, self-centered. This is the way they think. This is the way they act. They have no compassion for other people. They're only interested in themselves and their own agenda. Selfish and self-centered. And both of these men, Laban and Saul, will die in their sins. 2 Timothy 3.5. That was the last text that Warren gave us this morning. Having a form of righteousness but denying the power of God have nothing to do with such people. That context is a citizenry that are lovers of self. They're self-absorbed, boastful, arrogant. The word form means a semblance, an appearance. It's used by Paul in Romans chapter 2 and verse 20, of the Jews that rely upon the law and boast about their knowledge of God. They have, Paul says in Romans, a form, a semblance of knowledge of the truth. However, Paul exposes them as frauds by this question, you who teach others, do you teach yourself? Laban and Saul are two men in history that were around the truth. They heard the truth. They saw the truth. And yet, they never drank of the cup of the faith. Laban and Saul are damned, both men. And their wickedness is their history. Here's verse 12. And Michael let David down through the window, went, fled, escaped. All action verbs. Fled and escaped are in most of your translations. It's a key phrase for this next few sessions about David's life. You see it in verse 18. As for David, he fled and escaped. And in chapter 20 and verse 1, David fled and escaped. David's on the run. Here is where he takes on the persona of Richard Kimball, the fugitive, always on the move, staying in the shadows, never letting somebody get a good look at him, currying favor only and going to those only that he trusts the most. I think it's important at this juncture to ask the question, would he go to you? Would he go to me? Is our testimony so clear among the outsiders that he would know that there would be safety in going to you and into me? It raises the whole question of ethics when the Nazis came to Corey Tin Boom's home and uh, they knocked on the door and they asked her, is her father 
hiding Jews, she lied and said no. The Nazis came in anyway. And her sister had pled with her, don't lie. A lie is a lie is a lie. Don't lie about anything. And so when the Nazis came in to the house, they asked the sister, are you hiding Nazis? And she said, yes, under the table. I looked under the table. <laughs> Big joke. There's no one here. And they left. Who was right? They were both right. I would pray that God would give me the courage to lie. I would pray that God would give me the courage to do the right thing in the right moment. Both women did the right thing. And both saved the Jews at that day and that time. So, look, Michael lies. She lies to her father. And uh, that gives David time to get away and escape. But the question for you and me is here. Proverbs 17, 17. Are you and I the brother that's born for the day of adversity? Are we that kind of person? Are we going to help the helpless? Look at David right now. Look at him. He's just a young boy. What are we going to do to help him? God's program is in him and with him. Look at the danger that surrounds him. Saul sent messengers. You see that phrase in verse 14, 15, 16, 20, and 21. The tentacles of the king are everywhere. And they are working for him. Curry favor with the king? Tell where David is. And you'll reap a rich reward at that moment. Or, be faithful. Be faithful to God in each and every experience. Trust Him. God is at work in the lives of His people. No matter what they look like or the condition that they're in at the time. David is a king. He doesn't look like one. It looks like he's a goner. But that's the way God works. He saves in spite of all the circumstances. This is a text teaching us always and forever to be faithful. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this instructive word this morning uh, regarding the life of David and his rise. He is weak and he is feeble. And he is on the run. But we are learning in each and every experience that you take us through these ordeals not to ruin us, but to make us that we will come forth as gold and we will be valuable and useful to you and to the kingdom to come. Strengthen each and every one of us by your marvelous and powerful grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.